It is vampirism that belongs to the problems related to interactions with other people. This topic is a little more complicated, because it doesn't affect the etheric body, but rather the astral body. It is similarly vulnerable to this kind of attacks, although it is usually much harder to get to compared to the etheric body. The astral body is nourished and generated by emotions. This means that vampirism, energetic vampirism, and as a rule emotional vampirism, is tied to the fact that the vampire desires to get a hold of the donor by forcing him to feel certain emotions. It can be a positive emotion as well as a negative one. This usually makes no difference. As a rule, it is those who aren't any longer capable of absorbing vital energy of the earth element directly that engage in vampirism. In other words, from a metaphysical point of view, for the earth, these people are as good as dead. They no longer receive the earth's energy like all the living do. Therefore, this is probably why they are referred to as the walking dead which describes a state of consciousness rather than an actual dug-up corpse as it would commonly be described in literary works. What is meant here is a metaphysical death, or more precisely that the earth perceives them as no longer alive and they cannot take its energy the way that others can. Respectively, their consciousness wants to live as any consciousness or body and so it absorbs this energy in recycled, surrogate forms. And the closest and easiest energy layer to reach is the layer of the astral body, because even though it contains a large amount of information, there is still more energy in terms of proportion. This energy is of low density and very easy to take. And since people predominantly live in an emotional environment compared to an energetically dense etheric one, it is precisely this human interaction level that is most susceptible to such energetic damages as vampirism. And we are very familiar with this mechanism, the mechanism used by people to suck energy from others, by provoking them to a certain emotional response, because that's the easiest. You provoke an emotion, the consciousness opens up, and then you can suck anything you want out of it. Thereby, I repeat, the quality of this emotion is irrelevant. Take a closer look at such people. Such wise crackers, merry fellow that tell jokes around, repeating it five times, forcing everybody to laugh for totally uncomprehensible reasons. Or they can also happen to be unsufferable whiners, such masterful whiners that can suck you into their emotional vibrational frequency very easily. Able to instantly switch your mood to a different stage, a different phase, to match the mood of the vampire in a manner completely unnoticeable to you. Like you were in a good mood, and after five minutes of listening to the whining, your mood worsens, goes bad, as if you were thinking and feeling just the same way. Or on the contrary. It really makes no difference, as long as after such contact you feel drained of power and energy. This also belongs to vampire slang terminology, draining someone or bleeding someone dry. And so the state that you get in is precisely that one. After, you feel drowsy, apathetic, losing the desire to do anything. And even the etheric body loses its drive, meaning that vampirism, quite strong vampirism, automatically turns into a jinx. Or in other words, the etheric body starts feeding its energy to the astral body, trying to restore it a little, thereby losing energy itself. Elderly relatives and sick relatives are often such vampires. The reason for this is actually quite understandable, because an illness takes a substantial amount of energy and usually appears in consciousnesses that are incapable of absorbing the Earth's energy. And they are actually also seen by Earth as some kind of semi-dead bodies that it doesn't deem necessary to give its energy to.
And we can recognize these people by their behavior around younger folks. Usually, senile vampires very much love youngsters, the very young, because children aren't critical. They lack critical thinking and are very malleable to words, to these very initial emotional impulses. In order to protect your children from this kind of vampirism, Firmly remember, no matter how much you love your elderly relatives, never let them sleep in the same bed with children. This is categorically bad, a no-go. Better avoid that, because it may be that the elderly person does not even suppose that he can harm his grandchild with his hugging. But his subconscious will be doing this automatically because the subconscious has no morals. The subconscious wants to live and will try to snatch energy anywhere it can. Better get your elderly relative a dog. A dog would be better because a dog, as a rule, is always happy to give. A cat will think twice before it decides whether to give or not, whereas a dog doesn't pick and choose and would actually give all of himself to his owner, rather than putting your children at risk. Be extremely careful in these regards, please. In a child, it will manifest itself as evil eye. If a child has been subjected to vampirism, then this will certainly show itself as evil eye. He gets a fever, gets a stuffed up nose with all the symptoms of a cold, or starts to throw temper tantrums, behaves bratty, becomes rude, these kinds of things, in other words, and without apparent reasons. All of these symptoms are indicative of the fact that the child was subjected to a certain energetic breach. And this breach has to do with the simple fact that the emotional energy has been drawn. Therefore, be very careful in this respect. However, vampirism doesn't have to be individual, but can also be collective. Larvae and superlarvae are entities involved in the collective vampirism process. They are energo-informational formations, already semi-reasonable, I repeat, they are semi-reasonable, because in their mind they possess few programs on how and where to take more energy. This is why they prefer group gatherings, a crowd on the streets, a raging crowd in a stadium, a group of young people, more than three, hanging around, getting in all sorts of trouble and being excessively emotional. I suppose you've met such people before, pretentiously laughing, talking too loud, as if trying to attract attention on purpose. By the way, attracting attention is a defensive reaction, because they understand that their energy is tapped, and just like it is described in classic literature, vampire victims feel a state of euphoria in that moment. But the subconscious perfectly knows that this euphoria will not last long, and all of this will soon come to a lethal end. For this reason, they try to attract the attention of those around them, and so they naturally shift their attention towards them, meeting their eyes for at least a few seconds. And an impulsive replenishment takes place in that moment, and so the donor himself starts looking for other donors. The donor turns into a vampire for some time in order to survive. This is where all these legends come from, about when someone who was bit by a vampire turns into a vampire himself. If we translate it to today's language, yes, he turns into a vampire because he too wants to survive. In general, there are not very many of these vampires that are so extremely dependent on the surrounding environment. Usually people turn that way because of some physiological Logical peculiarities, such as, I repeat, illnesses, chronic illnesses, deadly illnesses. The subconscious, it knows that the life program is starting to wrap up and it very much wants to stay alive. And when you want to stay alive, all means are good. Whether it is your grandchild, your daughter, this doesn't matter, because the subconscious lacks this awareness. The mind knows, the I am knows, the soul does, but the subconscious is not burdened by these kinds of functions.
For what concerns your own vampires, your beloved vampires, they should be fed by the hour. Meaning that if you know that your relatives have such peculiarity, if you know the whys in advance, give your time to them knowingly. Just set a task for yourself. I am now giving away half an hour of my emotional energy to my mother and carry it out. When you have this issue under control, it starts being like donation for medical purposes. You won't be drained for all your blood, they'll drain 100 grams, 150, then you'll drink a glass of wine and receive in return, I don't know, in college times you would receive an exemption from the lecture. Now, I don't know, but you get something in return. Eventually, treat yourself to something. You know what you're doing and what for. The vampire will get used to the fact that there is a regular replenishment of energy and that there is no need trying to devour all and everyone. And you will get used to dosing these kinds of things and understanding its reasons. Your mind will start to develop in this sense. Firstly, you will begin understanding the connection of cause and effect, why a person behaves that way when he lashes out of hunger. And you will understand how much you should be given in return for what you're doing. Because you surely will want something in return, like information, aside from their complaints about how bad everyone is and about the bastards in the government, all those thieves and scumbags, but to get some additional information. Learn how to extract this information. Because there are a lot of useful things one can get from a hungry vampire, especially if it is of interest to you. And you will learn to control this process. Because the feeding process, and I mean the process of sucking energy, comes with a very specific sensation. If you learn to control this process, then you will be able to immediately recognize any kind of sudden, unsanctioned vampirism. However, we must understand that not only close people and family can be vampires, there are also just random ones you meet on the street. It can be casual acquaintances, or it can be close friends, and they are not always easily recognizable, especially if it is an experienced vampire. Sometimes they are very, very well camouflaged, and any vampire learns with the time to unmistakably recognize a potential donor, and this you will need to know and know well how they do that. First of all, they recognize it to a certain protrusion due to a certain mannerism of a person. It can manifest in many different ways. As a rule, it is some kind of emotional protrusion, because the energy extraction happens precisely from the emotional body. And this means that the person in question must reveal himself emotionally in some way. Usually, it is easy to detect in their communication patterns, manners of communications, sometimes in the way they dress, demonstrating their uniqueness to the world around them, like a bird showing off his colorful feathers to female birds around them trying to attract a mate. Well, similar here, there must be a certain protrusion. Women prefer flashy colors for clothes and hair, use loads of makeup, usually quite tastelessly, only for the purpose of attracting attention. They talk loud, but we figured this process out already. They do so to attract attention. Usually, it is related to an inner vulnerability we call a feeling of self-importance. The feeling of self-importance is a quite long-lasting, long-term program directly related to and actually is the flip side of either this dissatisfaction or inferiority complex. The feeling of dissatisfaction and inferiority, they too originate and exist within the astral body. The reason for their existence lies precisely in the low vibrations of the astral body, which we will be working with during the second main course. But you already should start to understand that they do exist. They are present in every astral body and sometimes are fixed in one's consciousness precisely for the purpose of making a person vulnerable in this sense, and therefore controllable. Things like conceit, for example. The reasons for conceit lay a little deeper, at a higher level, but are similarly connected to a certain inferiority complex related to dissatisfaction from not being recognized for the wonder that you are by the world around you. 
It is, by the way, this precise characteristic of consciousness, this quality of consciousness, precisely this state, that is called the feeling of self-importance. It's just that conceit is usually a long-term background program, whereas the feeling of self-importance appears only sporadically. Nevertheless, this feeling of self-importance of a potential donor is very accurately detected by the vampire through a series of exhibited signals. Loud voice, bright clothing, heavy makeup, a certain manner of speech, the use of slang terminology or obscene vocabulary, for example. Yes, you know, someone is walking and talking to someone and when swearing, he actually raises his voice instead of lowering, as it is usually done by people. Well, this is an indicator that the given person is a potential donor, as if saying, feed on me, feed on me, here I am, I am signaling my presence, maybe I'll be of use to this world, at least in this way. Observe the people around you. Usually, potential donors, not that they don't live long, but they don't live long successfully. Because people who value their life and energy and value their mental health, who work with their consciousness, they change their behavioral patterns too. They don't show off and aren't pretentious. As a rule, they will surely avoid creating Instagram accounts that show off the private aspects of their life and consciousness. This is done only by those who want to attract attention, which they usually live to regret, in the best case scenario in the form of an evil eye.